Hello, my name is Philip Dawson and I'd like to talk with you about alternatives to lectures. What can we do to teach when we're not giving a lecture? So I'd like to stress with you from the beginning that you are an instructional designer, not just a teacher. Your influence on student learning moves well beyond that lecture theatre. You make learning happen. You design activities. Students do stuff that you have created even when you're not around. So this video we'd like to focus on what the student does in classes that are not lectures. Designing versus conducting effective tutorials, practicals, labs and leading teaching teams because more and more that's a big part of the everyday academics role. So just as a bit of a follow-up if you've read a recent article by Kirshner, um, we talked about learning being defined as a change in long-term memory if you read that article. So we talked about how certain other modes of learning and teaching like constructivist or inquiry modes of learning and teaching are not very effective when learning is defined as a change in long-term memory. But does that match your definition of learning? Is that what you think of when you think of learning? Just stew on that one a little bit. So you may have heard me talk about what is the use of lectures. Lectures are the things we're finding alternatives to here and you know have talked about how lectures are as effective as other modes of delivery to transmit information so lectures are great for that. Especially if our definition of learning was that change in long-term memory from before then a lecture is a great mode of delivery for learning isn't it? Uh, not as effective as discussion to promote thought if we want people to think maybe there are other methods such as discussion, lectures can still get some of that done and if you've got the thousand students in a lecture, having a meaningful discussion with every single one of them or with groups of them is going to take a lot more time and resources than lecturing them. <clears throat> but lectures are actually ineffective. They tend not to work for social or personal development, to teach values, to inspire interest, to teach behavioural skills. All of these points are based on empirical evidence as synthesised by Bly, and I've got a link to that up there. So that's what lectures are good for and bad for. So if we want to promote thought, to stimulate social or personal development, teach values, inspire interest, teach behavioural skills, if we want you to think differently, more deeper, develop the ability to do something or change the way that you think about something, then we need something in addition to or instead of lectures. Lectures are not going to be enough and you might be hard pressed to find lecture only courses out there but they do exist. I hope their goals aren't to do any of these because they're not very effective if they only use lectures to do that. So we need something else. So let's start off by talking about what makes a great tutorial. When I say tutorial, also substitute in laboratory or practical or whatever else it is that you do that's a class that's not a lecture. What makes a good one? There's a lot of craft, there's not a lot of science. I can tell you things from my experience as a tutor and as a designer of tutorials. I can't tell you a lot from the science, I'm sorry. This video has some thinking points then, but actually as it's a lecture I don't think it will improve your behavioural or social skills as a tutor by a large degree. Even though this is a video lecture, it's still a lecture, it's still the lecture mode. So I don't think this video will make you a better tutor. It will give you some information to hopefully think about though. And I think one of the best ways to develop your skill as a tutor, as a designer of tutorials, is to discuss the craft of tutoring with peers. So designing great tutorials, well think back to your first tutorial experience as a student. It might have even been your first class at a university. It might have been maybe in the second week of semester and although it wasn't the first class, it was the first time you were forced to venture out and talk to somebody. What was that class like? What was that first tutorial you ran like? What advice did you get? I got very minimal advice. Um, I'll confide in you that the advice that I was given was to watch out for large groups of ethnic boys in the tutorial. 
these ended up not actually being a problem at all to me and the large groups of ethnic boys were actually one of the best resources I had in the tutorial. Uh, but I was given very, very little advice on how to be a great tutor. What do you know now that you wish that you knew then? Watching out for large groups of ethnic boys was pretty crap advice, I've got to say. Um, what advice were you given? But more importantly, what advice do you wish you could go back and give yourself as that first tutor? So, I guess another way we can think about improving tutorials isn't just what advice would we give ourselves, but what does tutoring actually look like in terms of our workload and our students' workload? So, this might be your time if you take a unit that I teach. Um, the majority of your face-to-face -face time in units that I run tends to be in a, a peer learning group or some sort of structured time with colleagues and a small amount of it's in the lecture. So we can see here that the tutorial or peer learning group or practical or whatever, time-wise is actually taking up more time of yours than other modes of teaching. So perhaps you could think of it in terms of your learning. Well, I might ideally think that your learning is 50-50 split between my lecture and something else like a peer learning group. Um, I've had feedback before that supports other variations on that pie chart. Or let's think about it in terms of my preparation time. Is this really very fair that for me the lecture, that big blue part, really takes up the bulk of my time in preparing, yet for your learning and your time the lecture might only be a smaller part or at best half of it. Maybe I should reconsider how I spend my time and I'd like you to think about the units you teach. What do those pie charts look like for you? Do you spend more time preparing for lectures or tutes? Do you spend more time teaching lectures or tutes? Do you think students learn more from the lectures or the tutes? If you find that you spend a lot of time on the lectures, the students don't spend a lot of time on the lectures and the students don't learn much from the lectures, perhaps considering a refocusing of your time might be worthwhile to improve actual student learning. Another way to think about tutorials is, well, how do our students spend their weeks? What does the average student week look like? And this is number of hours spent by Australian students per seven day week. And we can see that you know, things like travel. Travel actually takes a lot of time from the student's week. Do we consider that, you know, typical students spend six hours a week travelling to and from campus? We can see that they're spending a fair bit of time on campus excluding classes. So even outside of our classes, it's that roughly eight hours per week doing something. We can see they're spending some time here preparing for class, ten-ish hours per week. If you um, believe the 10 or 12 hour per week per unit expectations, then sadly these aren't borne out in what students actually do. And we can see that including classes, students are spending, depending on gender, 17-ish hours per week. So students are spending their weeks a reasonable amount on campus, a reasonable amount of that doing classes. So our tutorials factor into some of that, but compared with everything else on this page, our tutorials are a relatively small amount of the students' time per week. But what aren't our students doing? Well, in that same survey that gave us that lovely uh, chart on the previous slide, it was found that half of Australian university students never, or only sometimes, discuss class with peers or others outside of class. So this is pretty scary stuff. Half of our students are practically not discussing what we do in class with anyone else. Half of them are also not asking questions, like, like ever or only really rarely. Half are not really working with students during class. 
Now, we can't control this. We can't force students to do stuff, and particularly discussing stuff with peers or others outside of class. We can maybe build some tasks that require that, but we can't force them to do it. But within our tutorials, we can create an environment where this is more likely to happen. And I would urge you to consider how we can get this half of the Australian student body doing this stuff in class. So how do we design tutorials for discussion? First off, focusing on a learning outcome and communicating that explicitly to the students. Uh, the unstructured kind of, let's just have a chat about X. I don't know if you've been in a class where that's worked well. I don't know if you've been in a class where that's worked badly. I've been in both of those. There may be a bit of an art to making that unstructured discussion work well. My encouragement to you, particularly if you're designing tutorials for inexperienced tutors, is to give them explicit questions to ask that relate to a learning outcome, and that learning outcome relates to the assessment really clear tasks. Perhaps design the task, maybe a tutorial worksheet, maybe a question, whatever, and run through it yourself. Find a partner or colleague who you can say, let me just say these words on this tutorial sheet to you. I try to never go into a classroom with a tutorial sheet or a peer learning group agenda that I haven't physically said all of the words on it. This is a tough one, facilitating not dominating. You know so much about this content, but if we go back to learning being what the student does, you doing transmission teaching in the tutorial just kind of turns it into a suboptimal lecture. Knowing when is that right time to step in is difficult. I would argue that the time to step in is when you can help steer the conversation towards the outcomes that you're after, or when you can correct uh, a misunderstanding that the group's got, or where you think that it's really going to save the group a lot of time if you jump in and tell them this snippet of the information that they can then build on. However, if you find yourself talking for more than, say, 20 or 30 percent of the talk time in the tutorial, I would want to reconsider that. And wait time. Wait time is a, a tricky one. When you are trying to get that discussion going in the tutorial, it can be really important to wait, to ask the question and wait. Wait until it gets really, really awkward. Wait until that person who's sitting there and doesn't want to be, you know, the person to dominate the discussion and is kind of scared. Wait until that gets that awkward that they just say that thing they've been holding on to. Wait. If you try nothing else this week, try wait time. Really let things extend out. And for me, peer learning groups are a great structure for this. Another trick that I'll give you for running effective peer learning groups is to not answer the questions directly, to try and engineer an environment where you have students answering each other's questions. And the best way to achieve that is through wait time. So a student asks a question and you use wait time to make it that awkward that another student jumps in with the answer. Once students get into the habit of doing this as a matter of routine, you can sort of step back. So designing tutorials to elicit questions, because remember this was one of the things that 50% of students aren't doing or are only sometimes doing. Does anyone have any questions? Is kind of strangely one of the worst things you can do to get anyone's questions. Um, and particularly certain cultural groups don't respond well to that blanket, tell me about your weaknesses sort of question. So let's scratch, does anyone have any questions? Uh, if you're not sure if this works well, then just ask it at the end of your next lecture and count how many questions you get. However, see if you can try, maybe the following week, what is the most difficult concept from today's class? There's no admission of weakness to say that 
topic A was the most difficult out of the five topics that you showed us today. That doesn't show I struggle with topic A, that just says here's my objective assessment of the relative difficulty of these topics. So my suggestion is to try what is the most difficult concept. Working on rapport building is really important and can sometimes work better in a smaller class than a bigger class. And timings. How do we structure a, a tutorial that gets questions? Will we allocate time for there to be questions? We expect there's going to be questions. We build questions in. And again, peer learning groups I think are one of the better ways that we can get students to ask questions. Specifying tutorials, here I'm moving away a little bit from just designing them to how do we communicate these. Let's say we lead a teaching team. How do we get people to do this great design that we've built? You can go a fine-grained agenda or worksheet or lab manual. And if you've seen stuff I design, I tend to like to do that. Some other people prefer a topic or a question to use as stimulus. Here's something to get the discussion going. Some people like consistency across all tutorials. I tend to like that. Um, when I taught a unit that had students across seven different locations spread throughout regional Victoria, hundreds of kilometres away from each other, I wanted consistency so I could know that the learning outcomes were going to be the same. However, there is also another argument that the tutors should meet the needs of their specific groups, tailor examples to the local context, uh, consider the prior knowledge that the group has, which may be different from the other groups. If you run the tutorial at, say, 6pm on a Thursday evening versus the tutorial at 1pm on a Monday, I would guess there are going to be different students going into those groups that may have different prior knowledge. Perhaps you might give your tutors the freedom to tailor to the specific needs of their groups. I like to have regular reporting or team meetings. I hate meetings. I will very honestly tell you this. I think meetings are usually a waste of my time and everyone else's, but regular brief meetings with my tutors with an agenda can get those questions from them, can let me know what bits are sucking about this tutorial design. But of course, you can just have tutors report problems as they arise. And if you have a great team of tutors, sometimes they will off their own bat tell you. So you can see here, I've got sort of my approaches on the left, which are kind of control freaky, and a more laissez-faire approach to specifying tutorials and working with that team on the right. It's up to you whatever approach you take, but don't let yourself fall into an unconscious decision about how you're going to specify tutorials and lead that team without thinking about the options. If you'd like to read more about leading teaching teams, let's have a look at the state of the actual, what actually happens in those teaching teams. Uh, Benjamin uh, did a really interesting study of five teaching teams from various Melbourne universities and various disciplines, and for me, they reflect a lot of the different variations between teaching teams I've worked on. And definitely those elements from my previous slide are present in the, the different teams. Which of the teams sound most like the teaching teams you work on, and which one would you like to work on and why? If you are considering improving a unit that's taught by multiple people, I think you should, you should also consider improving or thinking about how you do team teaching. So, I have a challenge for you for this week, which is to choose one of these. And these come from Devlin and O'Shea's work on what do students from low SES backgrounds, low socioeconomic status backgrounds, need to learn at university. And I'll give you a little bit of a secret in discussions with Marcia Devlin. Essentially her thoughts privately were that a lot of these are just good teaching practice. They're nothing to do with students from low SES background. Those just happen to be the people who were saying that. So I think these points I'm going to go through are some really great practical, actionable tips 
to do better tutes. So teachers who are good teachers are those who are approachable and available to guide student learning. You might want to work on those. How do you be approachable? That's some of that sort of soft magic in the classroom. It's the arriving a little bit early, knowing the names, having that casual chat, being there, maybe being there for a few minutes afterwards, maybe being there on the email or phone or Moodle. Teachers who are enthusiastic, dedicated and have rapport with students. You can fake the enthusiasm, you probably can't fake the dedication, they'll see through that. And you can build the rapport. Teachers who use language and examples that students can understand. We know examples are a really powerful way to understand a concept, but sometimes we choose examples from our own in-depth knowledge of a topic, so perhaps we can find examples from the student's context. Again, perhaps we can find language from the student's context. And teachers who provide clear expectations in relation to assessment. Students seem to care a lot about not having to wade through a lot of busy work to figure out what our assessment tasks are. And I know this is my behaviour as a student as well. I expect it's probably yours too. So my challenge for you for this week is to choose one of these and work through it. Really focus deeply on how can I be this teacher because this is what the evidence suggests what students want and what helps them to learn. And the other challenge I'll get you to think about is to get your tutors trained or to ask what training is available to my tutors. What training have my tutors had? Because your tutors, I think, can be all of these things and I encourage you to support them to become that.